Hi, today we're going to talk about elastic plastic fraction mechanics, specifically the theory behind the J integral. And uh, it's going to be a little bit of theory derivation here today. And in later videos, I'm going to talk about how you can apply this and how you can measure it experimentally. But let's start with the theory so we can understand where this comes from. So elastic plastic fraction mechanics is an extension of the basic linear elastic fraction mechanics. And this is, as you may remember from my discussion about linear elastic fraction mechanics, it's only valid if the material is linear elastic and there's very little plasticity in, this in real life and it's uh, limited to region very close to a crack tip. Now, today we're gonna to talk about elastic plastic fraction mechanics. So the material can be non-linear and the material has to though still be elastic. So time independent, non-linear elastic behavior. This is the theory that was developed by, by Professor Rice at Harvard. And I was lucky enough to take a class from him back in the day. So he's a, he's a really good lecturer, I can, I can tell you, and he has some really good theories here. Now I'll talk a little bit about the plasticity part of linear elastic fraction mechanics and how you can put this together in a good way. So basically what I will try to do in the next few minutes is to derive this equation. It's a very basic equation, and this is the definition of the J integral. And it's a little hard to figure out what this means and what this comes from. And I'm going to tell you here today how, how you can get to this. So let's just define a few terms first. W is the strain energy density. N is the normal to the path around the crack tip. T is the surface traction. And U is the displacement. And X is the, the, uh, the direction of the crack. So those are the terms that are go into this equation. It's a path integral around the crack tip, as you can see. So how do we derive this? Well, um, the, it's actually really not that hard. So we start by talking about what's something called the potential energy in a general two-dimensional body. So that's the energy stored in the material and is defined by this equation. That's just the definition of the potential energy. We are limiting ourselves to a 2D body. It has a crack in it. This equation here doesn't really talk about the crack, but here it is. And uh, this is the strain energy density, we integrate it over the area and surface traction over the exterior surfaces. Now, here's the trick. We really are interested in cracks. So we're going to have to take a derivative of this potential energy with respect to the crack length. So that's the quantity coming down here. So we're just putting the differential equation difference here. Uh, and we see that it propagates into the integral sign here. And uh, the one thing we, we, we can do that's very convenient is we can replace the, the path here from the, just the portion of the path where the tractions are applied to all of the path because the region of the body uh, where there is no displacement, uh, there will be, it goes away. So we can replace this uh, path with a complete path. So that's very nice. Now I'm going to talk about how we can simplify this equation and rewrite it a little bit. So this is the equation we'll start with. The first thing we'll do is that we will introduce a new coordinate system. Instead of having a, a coordinate system in the center of the body, we apply now a coordinate system that's located at the, crick of the uh, tip of the crack. And uh, we introduce capital X and a, X1 and X2 for the local coordinate system at the crack tip. So here's the correlation between the, the two coordinate systems that we, we are interested in. And we want to use uh, this dif differentiation of uh, different quantities with respect to the crack length. And now we have this uh, equation that has two quantities in it. So we need to apply the chain rule. And we can show that this uh, derivative, the total derivative with respect to A, can be written in this form when we have this different coordinate system. So we can propagate that into the derivative of the potential energy with respect to crack length. And that gives us this equation here. It doesn't look any better, but it's actually something we can do about very quickly here. The next thing we'll do is to remember that this specific term here, the partial derivative of strain energy density with respect to crack length, we can write in the chain rule like this. We take a derivative with respect to strain and the strain with respect to crack length. And uh, what's cool about this is the W d epsilon ij is the equilibrium equation, and that's the same as the stress. So this only applies for a a nonlinear elastic material mall. So that's where that constraint comes in. For other material models, if they're time dependent, you can't go from this to this. But that's one thing we can plop that into this equation. And the next step is 
Um, we can see that this area integral of this, we can convert using the principle of virtual work, if you remi remember, remind yourself of that, you can convert it into this path integral of attractions of this uh, derivative here. What's really cool now is that they actually cancel out two terms. If I go back in slide, uh, by doing that, we can cancel out this term here with uh, the second term that we have here. So the whole partial derivative of potential energy with respect to crack length now becomes this equation here. It's a little bit inconvenient, this equation, because it's an integral over the area, and here's a part, uh, term that's an integral over a path. So we're going to apply the divergence theorem, and as you can see here, if you don't recall it, and then we can convert this from an area integral to a path integral, and that gives us exactly the answer we're after. So that's what Rice did. He came up with a J integral as a path integral of this kind, and that's the, that's the derivation of the J integral from scratch. So it's not that hard, and if you go through this carefully, you, you will probably see every step of the way. So to summarize some of the observations here, that's the J integral is equal to the energy, energy release rate. So the change of energy as the crack growth. And uh, this uh, applies to nonlinear elastic materials, uh, but it can also apply to plasticity as long as you have no unloading. Because if you, if you don't do any unloading, you can't distinguish between a nonlinear elastic and an elastic plastic response. This is an energy-based condition. And you can also think of it, if you sort of think about it, what does this mean? The energy is sort of, uh, potential energy is changing as the crack growth. That energy can be thought of as the energy that flows into the crack tip. And that's what's driving the crack to grow. Another thing you can do, and I'm not going to do it here, is to, to make this less uh, heavier than it needs to. It's pretty easy to show that the J integral is path independent. So it doesn't matter which path you take around the crack, crack tip, you get the same J, J integral value. And that's kind of the whole point of this. Um, there are some other ways to write the J integral. What I derived was the original form that Rice developed, but you can also write this in a little bit more, more modern terms. So the, here's an, a tensor formulation with the J integral. It's given by this equation here. It's a little more elegant and I think a little easier to work with in practice. C here is a second order tensor they're called the Eschelby tensor, and it's defined down here. It's, it's a quantity that depends on the strain energy density, the deformation gradient, and the first picola kirchhoff stress, all of which we know if we have, say, a finite element simulation. And it's normal to the path, and this is the crack growth direction. So you can find a crack growth direction that is the direction that maximizes the J. And uh, then you integrate this over a path around the crack tip. So that's another way to do it. It's in tensor form and a little bit uh, more arbitrary and easier to use, I think. Uh, you can also write the J integral in terms of a uh, path integral as an area integral. And here's a short version of that. This is an area integral in the reference configuration. C is again the Eschelby uh, tensor. And then we have the Lagrangian gradient of a virtual crack extension. So if you apply this, you will be able to come up with a good solution to the J integral. And this is suitable for finite element simulations. Now, let's move over to stresses and strains. It can be shown that if you have a very specific uh, material model in mind, and, and the one I'm going to pick here is the romberg oskod material model. And that has a, a, this form to it in, in the 1D case. So strain is, uh, is a linear portion, and then it's a nonlinear portion to the strain as a function of stress. K is, is a hardening parameters, and E is modulus. What was shown by by Hutchinson, who was also a professor, uh, is, is a professor at Harvard, together with Rice and Rosengren, is that they derived the complete stress field in front of a crack in the case where the material behaves according to this nonlinear elastic behavior or equation. And they show that the stress field uh, is given by this equation. So it's a constant that depends on the orientation or the angle from the crack tip. N is the power exponent to the stress strain curve. And then you have the J integral here divided by R, and then it's a power exponent that depends on the type of hardening that you have in the nonlinear material model. So we'll see that if N is equal to one, we get linear elasticity, and we get the traditional linear elastic uh, fraction mechanics response. We'll see also that the J integral has the very similar um, behavior or, or setup here as in linear elastic fraction mechanics, where we have a stress proportional to uh, K1 uh, in that way. We see that in this case, stresses 
and strains um, will go to infinity as R goes to zero. But in real life, that doesn't happen, of course, because of crack tip blunting. But the same argument as, we, as I used for linear elastic fraction mechanics is that this idea of J integral is still valid even if you reach a, a plasticity or, or permanent deformation state really close to the tap tip, the crack tip, as long as the surrounding material behaves according to the theory. And that's typically what the case is. So to summarize all of this, the theory for the J integral is actually pretty easy to understand once you go through the derivation. It's an extension of linear elastic fraction mechanics, and it is better suited, suited for polymers because polymers are not linear elastic in most cases. They, are, they can be described as non-linear elastic, perhaps, not linear elastic. Uh, typically, there is more to them, but it's a better uh, approximation, at least, of the response. And in upcoming videos, I will talk about how you can measure these things experimentally and how you can calculate it using finite element analysis and also how you can incorporate it, this into crack growth and fatigue type situations.